Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Dory Greenspan in conversation with Jackie Bur Burrell. My name is Jamie Madsen. I'm the marketing and events coordinator here and I'll also be your host for the evening. So I'd like to take a moment here and thank all of you for your continued support of this events program. Your purchases make this whole thing possible. So we at Copperfields are extremely grateful. Now, just a couple of items before we get started. Uh, the format will feature between 35 to 45 minutes of speaking and will be followed by a live Q&A. Please go ahead and submit your questions and comments under the Q&A icon, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Additionally, go ahead and keep an eye on your chat box. I will be sharing more info tonight about tonight's title, discount codes, other titles, um, by Dory and the like. So just pop that open and keep an eye out. So now I'm really excited to introduce tonight's author. Inducted into the James Beard Foundation's Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America, Dory Greenspan is the author of many award-winning titles, including Dory's Cookies, a 2017 James Beard Award winner, Around My French Table, a New York Times bestseller, and Baking From My Home to Yours, another James Beard winner. She lives in New York City, Westbrook, Connecticut, and Paris. And in conversation with Dory tonight is Jackie Burrell. Jackie is the senior features editor for the Bay Area News Group's publications, including the Mercury News and the East Bay Times. Uh, she also oversees Eat, Drink, Play on uh, the Sunday Food, Wine, and Travel section. So they are with us tonight to discuss Dory's newest New York Times bestselling title, Baking with Dory, sweet, salty, and simple. So I'm going to hand it straight over to you, Jackie. Why don't you take it away for us? Thank you so much. And hello to everyone. Um, I have to say, I first met Dory through her books. And her books are so joyous. And they have these little personal asides in them. And I just felt like besties back then. And the first time we talked by phone, I think was after Dory's Cookies came out. Um, and I have loved all of your books, but I have to say this one, and I, I'm just going to do my, uh, my poor man's sharing of the screen. This one is my favorite. Um, it's just been so much fun. Um, that book, I just want to really emphasize, uh, that book went to New York bestselling status this morning. That makes the third book of Dory's that has done so. And I don't know what the publishing world's version of going platinum is, but I, I think this is it. <laughs> so welcome, Dory. Oh, Jackie, thank you so much. It, this is, it's really exciting. The, the book is brand new. It came out last, a week ago, last Tuesday. Um, and getting the news today that it, it's on the New York Times bestseller list was Pitter patter, pitter patter. And it's so good to be with you. And Jamie, thank you. Thank you all, all of you out there, people from South Dakota, somebody who was at the Essex Market in New York when I had um, a cookie shop there. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Well, thank you for staying up with us. I was relieved when I found out you were in Connecticut and not in France because that would oh, have been really painful. Been, yeah, I, I don't, as much as I love you and bookstores and book, I don't think I could have done it. No, no. Well, we're gonna be talking about this book most definitely and the delicious things in it, but I'd also like to talk about kind of the backstory on that and how you got into baking and food writing in the beginning because I read on your bio that you actually burned down your family's kitchen when you were a kid. <laughs> yeah, I was 12. I was 12. It was, um, it was dramatic. It was very dramatic. Um, I hadn't cooked or baked anything before I was 12. And I wasn't allowed to cook or bake anything after that accident. I put a pot of oil up to boil and I put a lid on it thinking that it would make it boil faster and when I lifted the lid these amazing flames just you know the kind that spin around the top of the pot and go, right so I uh, no I wasn't back in the kitchen but I got married when I was 19 years old I was a junior in college and Michael 
who's still my husband, um, Michael had his first job. I was a student. And not only did I have to learn to cook because we couldn't afford to go out, um, I wanted to. I really wanted to cook. I wanted I wanted to have people around the table. I wanted our place to be the place that people hung out in. And so I taught myself to cook and to bake. So wonderful. But you were going to be a gerontologist first, right? Yeah. And now that I'm this age, I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> maybe I should try and find my old textbooks. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Um, I, I was working at a research center and from there I went to graduate school thinking that I would either teach or do research or be in a university and um, I never, I always say my dissertation was the only deadline I didn't meet. Um, I didn't make it and I, when it came time for me to, when I wanted to go to, back to work, didn't want to go back to the job I had, which was in research. And my husband said, why don't you bake? And that was, that was the start. Um, I got fired from that first job for changing their recipe, but mm, I quit the second job before they could fire me. But eventually I found, <laughs> I found my way. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a promising start. <laughs> but such an excellent result. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Back when Dory's, Dory's Cookies came out in, I want to say 2016-ish, we yeah. had talked at the time, and I have to say, you gave me advice that changed my life on how to roll out cookie dough. And you said, I don't know if you remember, but you said, don't chill the dough and then roll it out. Do it the opposite way. And I was like, mind blown. But you know, that you say that it was new to you just makes me feel great because when this came to me, I thought, that, okay, so the rules with dough say, make your dough and pat it into a disc and chill it. It needs to rest. And it, it, it has to do with having activated, I, I don't know anything about science, even though I'm a baker, but it has to do with having activated the gluten and now it has to relax a little. So you put it in the refrigerator, then you take it out. And the thing is hard as a rock, all the butter is right. And you're taking your rolling pin and you're bashing it, which you know has its own fun attached to it, but really, and you try to roll it and it cracks. I was so frustrated and I don't know where the idea came from, may, maybe from seeing, you know, those sheeting machines that you see in patients. I, I don't know, but I thought, what if you take the dough, you've made it, pat it into a disc, put it between two sheets of parchment paper and roll it out while it's soft, while it will do anything you want it to do. And then put it in the refrigerator. Does the dough care? when it gets to relax, you know, just, and I felt both like I was the bad girl in school because I had gone against what everybody had said you had to do. I'd broken the rules and I just felt so great. I could make dough do what I wanted that you feel that way about. It, it just makes me so happy. It's, it was a game changer. And I've done it with pie dough as well, pie crust as well. It works with everything. And there's no difference in the flakiness or the tenderness. Yep. And, but there is a difference in your mood. You're much happier, <laughs> much happier not having to bash that dough to get it to, to roll. Yeah. 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 yeah That's very exciting for me. <laughs> well, it was great. I mean, that cookbook was super fun. I think my favorite title of yours was the one, um, it's the Baking Chez Moi. I just, I laugh, I smile every time I hear that. But um, this book with its mixture of sweet and salty and all those things, I'm just really into. Before we go into it, I have specific questions about that book too. But I'm wondering if during the pandemic, have you been in Connecticut most of the time? The last- All of the time, all of the time. And yeah. were you baking sourdough like the rest of us? No, my husband was. Okay. <laughs> so my husband's the 
bread baker. I bake, excuse me, excuse me. Um, I, I bake bread and in this new book, in, in Baking with Dory, it's the first time since, yeah, since I think since Baking from My Home to Yours came out in 2006, that I've had a breakfast section. And so I have what I think of as daily loaves. I have whole wheat loaves and, and raisin loaves and brioche. And, so that's the kind of bread that I bake. My husband's the sourdough baker. So and he does baguettes and he does niche boule. He does uh, what we've been calling artisan bread. So he's the artisan bread baker and I'm the kind of borderline pastry bread baker. So I bake loaf breads primarily. Nice. But I was baking. Did you take up sourdough during the pandemic? I did. I did. I even named my starter Lois. Lois Love has it. been good for me. Lois, yes. <laughs> I baked a lot. Kneading bread really helped my anxiety. <laughs> so I think there, there were silver linings. There were many silver linings in what was a terribly difficult and for many tragic time. But I kept talking to people about being in the kitchen and it was hard for many of us because we're not accustomed to three meals a day for 500 days in a row um but i like to think that during this time those of us who love cooking and baking new people have joined our our, our clan that there are people, more people now who understand the pleasure of baking at home and will, will continue. I mean, what came out of hardship, I think will continue and be, be a lasting pleasure. I hope, I hope. I think so. I think everyone got a lot better at cooking and baking than I think, they normally would be. I think better and more confident yeah. You know, more sure of our own ability to get dinner on the table, to try something new, to succeed with it. Um, yeah, I think that as, as horrible as it was, it was good for the kitchen. It was excellent for the kitchen. Yeah. I know that writing these books is a, an extended process. There are so many stages. Um, when did you start working on this book? So this book is about three years in the making. Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, and that's fast for me because right, around my French table was four years. Baking from my home to yours was, I think, a little over four. So um, I'm getting faster in my old age. But it was three years and it, my manuscript was due, and I got it in on time, July 31st, 2020. So okay. this was both a uh, before times and during times book. I finished it here in this kitchen and it, it, changed, it changed the book because in the beginning I was writing as I often do. I live part-time in France, so I would be in Paris and looking at new pastry shops and going to the market and seeing new things and traveling and finding new ingredients, meeting people who were baking things I hadn't seen before. So there was all of that excitement of being out in the world and learning new things. And then I was here in my kitchen with only ingredients from the supermarket and really only my little brain to start thinking about what I wanted to do. And I think in many ways, the lockdown, and we were locked down, her son and daughter-in-law wouldn't allow us. Um, I, did, I didn't see a supermarket for months. They came, they lived with us, which was quite wonderful actually, but never let us out. Um, so it was, I think it made the book better. It made me think about what was really doable. What could I, I feel like over the years, my taste has gotten simpler anyway, 
But this was really a way of looking and saying, okay, does this need frosting? Nope. Does this need some spice that you're going to have to go someplace to get? No. How can I get you know, flavor and texture out of really basic ingredients? And I think it made the book stronger for my having to think about it that way. Yeah, makes total sense. I had noticed, I mean, your books have never been about esoteric ingredients, no. but this in particular, I had everything I needed in, you know, at a supermarket or in my cupboards. So that was now, great. You, you could bake on a whim, which is the I best think, kind. The best kind of baking. Right. So what spurred the book in the first place? <laughs> so I was in Santa Barbara for a wedding and I had a, a cheddar scone that was beautiful. And so I took a picture of it and put it on Instagram because that's what you do when you have a beautiful right. Um, and a friend of mine, the author, Anne Ma, she wrote this wonderful book called The Lost Vintage. Um, she's also written some cookbooks. And um, she wrote Mastering, Mastering the Art of French Eating, I think is the name of the title. And um, so Anne DM'd me and she said, you should write a savory baking book. And I thought, yes, that's what I need to do. And I had, after my last book, which was Everyday Dory, I thought, I'm finished. 13 books, Baker's Dozen, that's it. I'm out of the cookbook biz. But I got so excited that I, I worked on a proposal, I worked on an outline, and the book that I proposed was All Savory Baking. And that was the book that my editor bought. But as I kept working, the book kept moving to the sweet side more and more. And so there's um, there are recipes that kind of hover between sweet and savory. There's a section called Salty Side Up that's definitely savory. Um, but it ended up being more sweet than savory. So it's 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 just funny how it how it worked out. Yeah. How does your um, recipe writing process work? Do you start with sort of a general idea or you just start throwing things in? So, so I am not as organized as I look. I do everything. I have my notebook here just in case I and my pencil because you never know when I might have to take down a note. So I work in pencil and paper and um, I'll start, you know, kind of sketching out a recipe and pencil and paper stay here as I'm working. And sometimes as I'm working, I'll think this is never going to work. It needs, and I'll start, you know, changing. Sometimes I'll go all the way through and it didn't work. Um, so it's a constant, you know, until I get the recipe that I, I'm, I, that I'm happy with, that I hope is, you know, the solid one. And I put, I put three little stars on top to say that this is the one. And then I write it and I try to write the, the head note, the introduction. If, sometimes I'm, I, don't, I don't do it at the same time. Um, and then I write the recipe and I, my recipes go to a tester who's worked with me for 10 years but who probably could, if I gave her shorthand instructions, make the recipe. But I give her what I hope will be almost final because I want her to be testing language as well. You know, does she understand the instructions? And then when it comes back to me, sometimes it comes back, we love this in my house. And sometimes it comes back with, you know, I love you. She's always very sweet. You know I love you, and you know I love your loaf cakes, but this one isn't really worthy of being in the collection. And I, it, it's kind of a stab, but after I get over the hurt and I reevaluate, I, you know, or there's a mistake in it, or the baking time isn't right. I mean, it's always a back and forth. Um, there are very few things. I mean, there's nothing that I make and publish. It's always tested and usually it needs a, another tweak or so. 
with the amount of baked goods coming out of your kitchen, like your neighbors must be the luckiest people in the world. How do you get rid of the food? <laughs> so I practice what I call bake and release. <laughs> so I bake, I cut it, you know, I, I give my husband a taste. Um, when the kids were here, they were great tasters for me. But I usually keep a, I keep some so that I can taste it the next day and see how it holds up. I keep some to put in the freezer so that I can see, you know, how, how it holds up, how it defrosts. Um, and then I give it away. And when, when we were living in New York, um, we're one of the few apartment buildings in Manhattan that still has elevator men. And so um, I, I, would, I would feed the elevator men which was, it was so nice to have a ready audience. Um, yeah, now my neighbors, now, now it goes into my neighbor's mailboxes. Nice. You even have to put a little note, they, they know. They just know. Yeah, they know. I love that, I love that. <laughs> well, there's such fascinating things that you've done in this book that I don't, like I read it and I'm like, oh, let the berry, the berry biscuits they use for shortcake. I'm, in fact, I'm going to see if I can find that page and hold that up. In the, the bread. Is it in the bread thing? Yeah. So it's like a, it's like a cross between a biscuit and a blueberry muffin. The muffin. berries are in the biscuit and then more berries and whipped cream. So I just, I don't know that my lights may, maybe it's, shiny to see but um yeah I be one and here it is without the short the filling but I you know when you I, I work by myself here I love the pictures in this book oh it's so beautiful love them yeah. um you know I'm here I'm here working by myself. And um, my husband says I talk to myself. I know I do. Um, but when something comes out, I get really excited. And so I'm like, when I thought I could put blueberries in a biscuit, I, I, you know, I mean, yes, yes. You know, and I, get, I actually say these things out loud. Um, somebody just wrote, Bailey Freeman wrote, Love the blueberry biscuits. We ate them for breakfast this morning. Yay. Thank I you. I love that. Thank you. That's um, awesome. You know, but it's, this, I tried and, and, and I had so much fun doing that in this book. Um, I try to build a little surprise into as many of the recipes as I can. Just something that, you know, you take a biscuit. It's a biscuit. You've had biscuits before. Then you take a bite and you have to stop, at least I hope you do, and, and think there's some, yes, this is different. This has a different spice or the texture is a little different. Just something that makes you pay attention to, to the usual in a, different, in a different way. I love doing that. So nice. Well, I've always thought the, the one shortfall of like a strawberry shortcake or a, a blackberry shortcake is that there isn't enough berries in the mix. And this, I love that. Now you can have double, yeah, double, double, double the berries. You can have them berries. In, in the middle, all around, yeah. Nice. And then the, um, I love, and I can't pronounce it, Gougere. You the, pronounce it very nicely. Okay, the little cheesy puffs, I love so much. And you have made cheese sticks with them. Here's a picture. So that was, I mean, that was another thing. So Gougere have become my signature, not, not because I set out in life to have such a thing, but I just love Gougere so, so much. And I love, so Gougere made from cream, essentially cream puff dough from pate choux, choux paste. And so the same dough, I'm obsessed with the dough, the same dough that makes a cream puff can make this cheese puff. It can be either sweet or savory. And so when I learned that I didn't have to pipe the gougier, that I could just use a cookie scoop, I thought, okay, I can do this. I, you know, this is easy. And when I learned that I could scoop the dough out and put it in the freezer and bake it directly from the, 
I thought, oh. this is it. This is it. And now when anyone comes to our house, I open the door. I have hot douche air and cold wine. And it's just become my thing. And because the dough is so, it'll, it, 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 it's a very plain dough. It doesn't have, it really has no seasoning, no flavor, no spices in it. You can do almost anything you want with it. And so I've been playing with Gougere. Um, the traditional one has either Gruyere or Comté. I've made it with, you know, shredded cheddar in a bag from the refrigerator case of the supermarket. Um, I've made it with all cut with smoked cheese. You don't want to use too much smoke. You want to mix. Um, and in baking with Dory, I make it with Gouda and cumin, which is Ooh. just such a nice combination. And then as I was scooping, that's when I had the idea, these could be sticks. And because the shape changes, the ratio of like crusty outside and custardy inside changes too. So you have a different, you, it, it, you have a different sensation as you're eating the same, the same recipe essentially. It's fun. Very fun. I love that. Um, there's, I love all the little notes in this book, the little, all the tips are playing around. And you've got a maple walnut pie in here. And I just was charmed when the playing around tip was, if you're making this for Dory's husband, add chocolate, half a <laughs> cup will do. So, yes, yes. If you plan to invite Michael for this pie, please put a little chocolate in. So I, years ago, and I still make it, um, I made a pecan pie with chocolate. And ever after, Michael has wanted chocolate in his nut pies. And the maple walnut, it's, it's a first cousin to the pecan pie. The, the goo is similarly gooey, but walnuts are not as sweet as pecans. They have a little edge to them. And I think even maple syrup is edgy. It's sweet, but just kind of borderline. There's a little flavor that tips it a bit. And so first cousin to pecan pie, but a little, a little edgier. There's another, there's a bunch of pies and tarts in here, but there was one um, that was like a brown butter mulling spices apple pie. Mm -hmm. How did you come up with that idea? I was thinking about apple cider and the spices, if you're mulling cider or mulling wine and thought, apples, mulled spices, it's got to be good. But you, you know, you, you, must, you must have this too when you're either cooking or baking. It's, you can't, I mean, I try and plan things out, but sometimes you're just looking at what you have in front of you or you're looking at what you're working on and you think, what if, you know, or you have a memory of something and it just changes the way you, you play with that, that recipe. And if I wanted, you know, if I sat down and said, I want an apple pie that will have the fragrance of fall, I would never come up with it. It's only for me, it's only as I'm working that you know, it's just one little thing that sparks, sparks an idea. Yes. Brown butter is such a magic thing. Yes. I've been making these um, chocolate chip cookies that have brown butter in them mm -hmm. and they're to die for, but sometimes they come out of the oven all beautiful. And sometimes they just spread like crazy. I end up with one very large cookie. Which is I, not a bad thing either. Uh, that's true. Yeah. They're just not as pretty. But, but you know, I think I, I wouldn't, I, that, that's not a failure. Um, but I think that more so in baking, maybe always in baking and maybe rarely in cooking, if something doesn't come out, you still can have something delicious. It may not be what you meant to do. It might not look like the picture that was next to the recipe. But I mean, unless you've burnt it to a crisp, you know, you often get 
something that a little bit of ice cream or whipped cream <laughs> will, <laughs> yeah, hide all the sins. Mm. I love that. Yeah, but, it, but it, because the ingredients are good, the combinations mm -hmm. are good. You just took a little left turn somewhere. <laughs> You've got a cookie in the book. I'm paging through the book as we're talking. You've got a cookie in the book that is ginormous. Yes. <laughs> um, so I did, when I was, I think we're talking about one big break apart. Yeah. That's the one. Um, did you have it, shall I? I'm, I'm looking, you talk about it. And unless okay. you have it handy. Page one. Yeah. Yeah. So. The book has these little sections that came about um, at the very end. I didn't even know I was doing this. Um, when I went to kind of, I put, I put all the recipe names on little sheets of paper. And then I was kind of dealing them out like a, like a card player to figure out if I had chapters and what went in each chapter. I wait to the last minute to do this. Um, and I realized that I had, little mini collections. I had a bunch of recipes that used brioche dough, including like cheese swirls that are like babka. Um, I had a bunch of apple recipes, a bunch of meringue recipes, and I had a lot of chocolate chip cookies. And so when I made, I decided to put them together as little collections and to call them sweethearts um, because because I love them. And so the one big break apart chipper is one of the sweethearts. And I can't remember, I, I, I've now since this done a bunch of big cookies because I love the whole idea of it. I don't know how it started, um, but I love that you make this cookie, you roll it out, you don't care what the shape is, you don't care if it's perfectly round, it can be all, you know, raggedy edged or higgledy piggledy, and you bake it. And then you, I know where the idea came from. Um, and then you either take a pizza cutter and cut it into pieces, or you just put it on the table and let everybody break a piece off. It's the communal cookie. There's a cookie, there's a French, it's kind of a cookie. And it's a very plain, almost like pie dough cookie. And it's meant to be served as one, and I think, and broken. And I think that's the first, the first one that I made. But this one is so much fun because, because what's more fun than playing with your food? And you, yeah, and you get to play with your food here. So fun. Well, at some point, you must have been thinking, what would happen if a Reese's peanut butter cup and a s'more got married at an ice cream parlor <laughs> and we have <laughs> s'more cake. Oh, you know, I wish that's what I had thought. Oh, great. Okay. Do I have time to rewrite the head note? <laughs> that's, so I love this cake. I love this cake. So I love ice cream cakes because they're a party waiting to happen. You know, you make them, they're big. Um, they're great for holidays. You make them, you put them in the freezer. You don't have to think about them until it's time to serve them. It's, they're the best party cakes. And I, had I ever used marshmallow fluff before? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because I, I, I've been a failure at um, Rice Krispie treats. I have never, I've never made a good one. I've had all kinds of ideas for what I could do with them, but I've never made a good one. So fluff is not my usual um, ingredient, but the idea of fluff and peanut butter, yeah, that was kind of intriguing. So this is such a mix up of it's ice cream, it's hot fudge sauce, it's that kind of fluffer nutter, um, it's, peanuts it's i love this cake and it's s'moresian and yes reese's peanut butter cuppy in thank you yeah just As, a, fact you figured it out for me <laughs> it looks like such fun we we need to talk about this also oh i just made that last week again 
It's so beautiful. It's so, it's so beautiful. And it's like a little cheat because it's, I call it fridge fancy because everything just comes out of the fridge. It's store-bought puff pastry that you score and then bake. And then because you've scored it, you can see like the picture frame rectangle that you've made and you just, you know, crumble the, the, the inner puff, put it down there. It can have hummus as the filling, store-bought, tzatziki. You could make a, a ricotta. I have a recipe for it in the book, a ricotta herb mix. So the store-bought puff pastry, the store-bought filling, a bunch of vegetable ribbons, which you also can buy, hard-boiled eggs if you'd like, um, and, and a vinaigrette that you put in a jar and just shake. And it's, I was, this, this recipe, I, 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 I was in Paris when I made it the first time. And I felt like I was just channeling the inner Parisian hostess that I wasn't. Um, <laughs> because I, I always feel that when I go to a friend's house for dinner in Paris, that they've just, you know, they, they, they like it was nothing. And they present something this beautiful. And I did it. I presented something as beautiful as that, and it was nothing. And then I came home and made it with, you know, came back to America and made it with ingredients from the big Y. Um, and it was just as, just as good. It's a great, it's a great recipe to know about. Again, for the holidays, it would be, it's gorgeous and easy. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Well, let's talk about the holidays because they are coming up soon. Yes. Yes. So what, what do you do for Thanksgiving? What do you make? So um, we share Thanksgiving with friends of ours. And of course we didn't last year. Um, I don't make turkey. For years, I didn't make anything that was bigger than what I could hold in my two hands. And so... Yeah, a turkey. So, and because I, I want to make dessert, there's never, there's not enough real estate in my oven for the turkey. So my friend Leslie will make the turkey um, and she'll do a bunch of the vegetables. I love to make soup. So I'm going to make soup to start. Somebody said to me, soup isn't Thanksgiving, but I've always made soup for Thanksgiving. Yeah. So I'm going to do a chestnut um, pear soup to start. And I'm going to, I'm in charge of the cranberry sauce and which I love to make and which I feel is almost dessert. Um, and then I'm going to make the, I'm, I want to make, I don't know if there's going to be room, I'm, I want to make everything. So I want to make the cheese puffers or the gougere to have as a little nibble when they always have a ham that Yale slices and I thought these little like either gougere or cheese puffs would be nice then this then soup then whatever else everybody wants to make and then I get to make dessert um I all, I might make the mushroom I have to find it I love this I'm gonna make the cornbread from the book and I'm the, going, this one that's the one I want to make oh yes. my gosh beautiful so again uh Oh, I love the, the crust on this one. But again, something that you roll out and you don't have to think about how precise it is. And then it has a little ricotta spread and it's got sauteed mushrooms on it. And I thought that would be nice as a starter too. Then I'm going to make the walnut maple pie. With chocolate. Of course. And I want to make, it's not at all traditional for Thanksgiving, but I want to make, and I think it's a great idea, the French Riviera tart. You know, we never think of, it, it doesn't look very Thanksgiving, I know, but we're having so much food and we're having so much rich food that having a lemon dessert at the end would just be a, a sparker. And this tart is it's so puckery. It's so puckery that it would just kind of 
wake everybody up at the end of the meal. So I'm going to do that too. Nice. When do you start your holiday cookie baking? So I start early because, well, you know this, you can freeze so, so much of the dough that I can bake when I've got time. I can, you know, prepare dough when I have time and then bake as, you know, as I, as I need it and when I'm ready for it. When do you start? Don't tell me before it started. No, 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 no. I usually start like Thanksgiving week and we have a whole, a whole tradition of the order of it. And we have to put on a white Christmas on TV to play during. And then we always start with the molasses crisps, always some kind of spice cookie. So when you say we, who's baking with you? So my kids come home and I bake with them, especially my daughters. My daughters love to bake, so. And do you always bake the same cookies? We, we have a couple of them that we, it's not Christmas if we don't make them, like the molasses ginger ones, um, but I always try and mix it up and try something new. We had some really fun, like snickerdoodles meet cornflakes with cardamom that we did last year. Oh. or the year before, they looked like hell. They looked like little nasty little crunkly balls, the <laughs> best tasting things ever. I was putting on like little sparkly, you know, edible gold stars to try and hide how ugly they were. And after a while, my son-in-law was like, stop doing that. Oh, they're fine. They're fine. So were they like um, haystacks or do you know those? Corn yeah. Corn yeah. Corn no, corn no, corn. they they were like a pretty standard cookie, except that you crush cornflakes and put them in. And it had a lot of cardamom, which snickerdoodles don't normally have. And then you roll the cookie in more crushed cornflakes. So they just looked like little brown blobs. But, but they good. were great. So good. But good. But so good. good. Yeah. yeah. So I, I cannot let any holiday, I mean, I, well, I wouldn't want to, but no one would let me without making world peace cookies. So that's that's part of just about every holiday. Um, and so that I've been making that cookie ever since um, I got the recipe, which was before the year 2000. It was Pierre Hermé, the pastry chef in Paris, who gave me the recipe. But in Baking with Dory, I did something I've never done in 20 some odd years. I changed the recipe. So there's a recipe for World Peace Cookies 2.0. Ah. And um, I always, people had asked me, you know, would you add mint? Would you add peanut butter? Would you? And I always said, no, 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 no. The cookie is, the cookie is perfect. So I'm never going to change it. But Charlotte Druckmann wrote a book called Women on Food and asked if I would make a world peace cookie for her book. And I said, no. I said, it's perfect. I, no, no, I won't. Um, and then I did. And I love this cookie. So I tried to think of the characteristics that I admire in women. And I tried to match those with ingredients. And so the World Peace cookie, which is a chocolate cookie that has brown sugar and chopped chocolate and salt, now also has cocoa nibs for strength, rye flour for earthiness, chili pepper for that kind of unpredictable quality that we love in women. And oh, it's a coconut strength, right? Rye flour, earth, freeze dried raspberries because you oh. have, they're just a surprise. They're kind of a little tart, a little tangy, a little sassy. And so that's there for verve. And while I love the idea, it, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have changed the cookie unless it was really good. And so the cookie is like, intellectually interesting and so delicious so this will be this will be my holiday my holiday cookie love it love it we're going to take some questions from viewers but before we do i just wanted to remind people that 
you can order this book from Copperfields Books. Um, if you're not in the wine country, they will ship them to you or order them through your, your uh, favorite independent bookstore, please. Jeff Bezos is rich enough. We don't need to give him more money. The man just went to space. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, I live on the other side of the country. Um, and I was just at my local independent bookstore and had a conversation with some customers I didn't know. And we all said the same thing, that through the pandemic, we knew that the, the, the bookstore became a touchstone for us. The newsletters that came recommending new books, the fact that we could still get our books, that we could continue the conversation about books, and that now that we can visit the store, it's it, it, the way those of us who love books, when you walk into a bookstore, there's a certain feeling and there's that excitement that you might find something. It's like a treasure hunt. You might find something you didn't know. And, um, you know, I hope I can get to Copperfields, but I think we should keep in mind what treasures we have in independent bookstores. So true. So we've got a question from Bailey who says, you use spices so beautifully in your recipes. Do you have a favorite spice and where do you get your spices? Thank you. I get my spices from many places. A lot of people bring me spices, which is fun. They'll give me spices for um, as, as a gift. Um, I Do I have a favorite spice? I like, I love star anise, which I use whole in um, when I'm cooking beef. I love it in a stew. Just, I there's the scent of it is if, if you don't know it, it's the kind of spice that you don't know, you use it once and you'll remember it forever because the aroma is so interesting, almost haunting and a little, little there's something mysterious about it. I love it. And I like using a little of it in cookies or something that I'm baking because it's unexpected and it, it both blends nicely with other spices but it also, if you give it a starring role, it, you, it, it makes everything new. So a spice like that, Jackie, you mentioned cardamom. I can't get enough cardamom. I love that flavor. Yeah, yeah. so good, so good. Uh, Christina asks, what are the advantages and disadvantages of various oils in your cooking? Vegetable, corn, olive, canola. Right, so um, I... I found myself using oil, using oil more often in cakes than I had before because I like you get Jackie. Do you find that you get a kind of spongy texture when you? Yeah, I love that. Especially like an olive oil cake. Oh, love that. And, and so there, there's a, an olive oil cake in the book that I love. It has apricots and pistachio also. Um, and I use olive oil in that cake because I want the flavor of olive oil. There's olive oil in that lemon tart that I showed you. Um, when I'm baking and using oil, I usually use an oil like canola because I'm using it for texture more than for flavor. So that would be my standard go-to. Um, that makes sense. Right, mm -hmm. corn oil. If you're making cornbread with oil, it's nice to use corn oil. But and sometimes, depending on what it is, a little bit of nut oil will give you a tiny bit of like under flavor that's nice. Nice. But I wouldn't use it as a you know as the major the major oil. Yeah. Uh, Diane says, when I lived in Switzerland, I had a tiny kitchen, no oven, two hobs, a fridge the size of a mini fridge, and a microwave. What's the smallest kitchen you have ever cooked in? And by the way, you guys have the same hairstyle, but Diane says hers is more white. <laughs> it's just the light. You can't see the light. So I have a feeling that I may have cooked in your kitchen. My smallest kitchen, I actually... 
I have two kitchens that rival one another for small smallness. Um, the first kitchen when we got married was was like this. It was really narrow. I did have an oven. You had to stand outside to open the oven door and could only get to things sideways. Um, and it had a real refrigerator. My first kitchen in Paris, however, had, it was the, the, the tiny little pathway between the living room, dining room, everything room, and the bedroom. Um, it had a tiny sink a half refrigerator, like a dorm refrigerator, um, two hot plates, no oven, um, and I didn't have a microwave. So yeah, I think we share, I think, I think we may have been cooking in the same kind of kitchen. But that's when I learned the joys of a Dutch oven. Yeah. I made everything in a Dutch oven that year. We have a question from Roosevelt. I love this question. What is a holiday that is not usually associated with baked goods that you celebrate with something special? Boy, what is a, I feel like this is one of those puzzlers like rhymes with <laughs> a holiday that isn't, so certainly not birthday, certainly not Thanksgiving, Certainly not Christmas. New Year's doesn't have a particular. It's good, yeah. Of course, we have dessert. In fact, so except for the pandemic year, um, we spend New Year's in Paris and usually make dinner at home. And then at midnight, we go out over the Seine and have a glass of champagne. I know it's pretty great. Have a <laughs> glass of champagne, wish everybody over there, thousands of people out and everybody's saying, you know, banane, banane. Um, and then we come back to the house and have cookies. So not associated with, do you, can, Jackie, can you think of a holiday? We used to celebrate our kids' half birthdays as well as their regular birthdays. And I would bake like, half a cake, half a cupcake. <laughs> Very and, yeah. Very but we pretty much celebrated every oddball thing. Like we were just a celebrating family. And any, any other cultures holiday, we celebrated that too. You make mention in the book of, um, is it Fika? Fika. Yeah. yeah we I'm should adopting have... that. <laughs> We should also, when I was in, in Stockholm, I met this pastry chef, Mia Orn, and she invited me to her studio for fika. And if anybody out there is Swedish and I get this wrong, please correct me. I'm looking at the chat box, like, is anybody <laughs> there? Um, it's the custom of stopping two or three times during the day to have some, often it's coffee, and often it's something sweet. And it's just meant to be a time where you stop and you just talk to people and you, it, it's, not, it's not a coffee break so much as it's a coffee like clatch. It's a time to be together. And then little kids have a fika before they go to bed, they may have sandwich and milk. So, if we were to take a fika, we could be baking something different every day. It's a good I love thing. it. It's a good <laughs> It is. Uh, Lisa asks, how do you use vanilla paste? So I don't use vanilla paste all that often, but I would use it the way I would use vanilla beans if vanilla beans were only affordable again. Um, yeah, price of vanilla is crazy now. Um, the vanilla paste, if you were using it, let's say in a cookie dough, it would be good to put it into the dough when you're mixing the sugar and butter together so that you get a nice mix of it. If you're going to put it in a custard or something, better to like warm the milk, put the, uh, I love the way I'm like, like I'm like, put the <laughs> in a little bowl and just, you know, soften it in the milk so that you don't get you know, clumps of it, but that's a good way to get a lot of vanilla flavor. 
Nice. Uh, Rosabelle asks, which dark rum do you like for baking? What an interesting question. I don't know. I'm, I'm looking like, okay, it's downstairs and right to the left, you know, over to the left there. Um, I don't know that I've had a brand. I had, somebody gave me some wonderful old dark rum that I'm sure I was meant to drink, but since I don't drink rum, I baked with it and that was really nice. Um, yeah. You've got a recipe in the book for, I think you called it everything cake. Yeah. And that, that cake has like 14 variations on that or nine, but one of them was a boozy variation. Yeah. So like apples and calvados or prunes and armagnac or raisins and rum or yeah, something yes. boozy. Uh, Molly Jo says, my great grandmother made potato chip cookies been trying to find a recipe for them. Any thoughts? They're very light and buttery. Oh, I don't I, know. Do you know? No, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I, it sounds kind of mid-century too. Maybe. Oh, I'm, and now I'm curious. Really made with potato chips? Or... Yeah. Yeah, hmm. like maybe crushed in there? I, maybe, I don't know. Maybe the, your cookie without the cornflakes, but with potato, with potato chips. <laughs> that, that might work. Uh, let's see. Uh, Christina says, I'm hearing about expected shortages of chocolate coming our way globally. So sad. Just in case, what's a potential alternate ingredient to chocolate? Chocolate is chocolate is chocolate. I can't, I mean, other than cocoa, which is chocolate. Yeah. No. No. Maybe just stockpile it now as if it was toilet paper. Or pray to pray. the chocolate. <laughs> to the chocolate. Oh, that would be how sad. Yeah, I know. Uh, Sarah asks, can you substitute normal flour for rye flour? No. No, it's um, the proteins are different. You're not going to get the same texture. The absorb. I mean, and this is this is coming from. You should check this. But this was because, as I said, science is not my subject. Um, you could take about twenty percent of the all-purpose flour in your recipe and fill that in with rye. But if you use all rye, you're going to get something that's really different which isn't to say that you shouldn't try it, but it, I, I don't think that all purpose and rye are one-to-one -one subs. Yeah. Okay, well, we are up at the top of the hour. I'm gonna turn this back to Jamie, but first I wanna say thank you so much, Dory. This has been so much fun. This was so, I, I, the time just flew so quickly. Thank you, Jack. Thank you everyone who came and I, Somebody just said, I have a few potato chip cookie. I didn't watch the chat because I was watching you, <laughs> but um, there's a lot going on there. So thank you everyone for being so interested in our conversation. Thank you. This has been so fantastic. I echo all the sentiment of you guys in the chat box saying you could watch YouTube for hours. <laughs> I feel like I'm there. Um, Thank you to everyone who came. Great questions, great feedback tonight. But most importantly, a huge thank you to you, Dory, and you, oh. Jackie. For all of you wondering, yes, this is being recorded. You will all receive an email tomorrow. It'll have the link to the recording. It'll have tonight's title. It'll have the discount code. So if all you did was watch, no problem. We've got you covered. Just check your email tomorrow. And with that, Dory, congrats on your New York Times bestseller. And you want to take us out? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Jackie? Thank you. It was, it was so good to talk to you. Oh, it was Thank wonderful. You. Have a great evening. <laughs>